Ladies and gentlemen, could you please stand for Her Excellency the Governor of New South Wales, Professor Marie Bashir, and her husband, Sir Nicholas Shahadi, the patron of the Cauliflower Cat. Thank you. Most welcome, and I give you over to our wonderful MC, Stephanie Brands. Thank you very much, Peter. You can be seated now, everybody. Thank you. Well, it is good afternoon and welcome to you all to the annual luncheon for the Cauliflower Club in conjunction with the Primary Club for 2013. I would also like to acknowledge the presence here today of the Premier of New South Wales, Mr Barry O'Farrell, and his wife, Rosemary. Welcome to you, Premier. Now, just a quick check. The table over there, you can hear perfectly. Excellent. And this corner? Good stuff. Thank you, everybody. To introduce myself, my name is Stephanie Brandt. I'm a presenter with ABC TV Sport and Events. We're proud broadcasters, of course, of the Shoot Shield Rugby in New South Wales and the ACT, but also of the feats of our Paralympic athletes in the summer and the winter. Most of those athletes have, of course, at some time been beneficiaries of the wonderful support of the Primary Club, who since 1974 have been fulfilling that fundamental aim of helping to give people with disabilities the opportunity to experience the joy of living through sport and physical activities at all levels. Now, more recently, the Cauliflower Club has swelled that support in their quest to help people with a disability, particularly those caused by sporting injuries. And uh, they do that through the provision of recreational and rehabilitative facilities. One shouldn't say rehabilitative too many times, I don't think. Now, we will, of course, be hearing from uh, Mr. Peter Fitzsimons, the president of the Cauliflower Club, again shortly, uh, so I won't expand any further on their work and steal any of his material. But before I invite him to the stage, a big thank you to all of you, of course, for attending. You're in, fa in for a fantastic couple of hours, and all you have to do really is, uh, well, you get to sit back and enjoy, so it's quite simple. Uh, you have already, by virtue of being here, been entered in our raffle, and we have some super prizes which we'll be drawing throughout the auction. Uh, you will see our, uh, throughout the luncheon rather, <laughs> you won't be subjected to an auction, I promise you. Now you will see that uh, very creatively our centrepiece today, now people are known for stealing the centrepieces uh, at functions. Um, I, I don't believe too many people will be nicking these. Hopefully the air conditioning stays quite cool or we'll be smelling a bit like a greengrocer. But the beautiful cauliflower in the middle of your table is a centrepiece. You will see a drawstring bag attached to that. And uh, should you wish to express more support for the Cauliflower Club, we invite you to please place any donations in there. As you can see, uh, it's perhaps a little bit more stable if you put paper money in there, uh, as opposed to anything silver or gold. But all donations are, of course, uh, very much, we're very grateful for them and, and we accept them with pleasure. Now, as many of you may have heard, one of today's special guest speakers was due to be uh, Mr. Richie Benno, who was involved in a car accident a few weeks ago. He was very much looking forward to being here, but unfortunately his beloved 1963 Sunbeam Alpine uh, had a close encounter with a brick wall. Uh, Richie was admitted to hospital, unfortunately with shoulder and chest injuries and I believe a broken sternum. Um, his concern was apparently less for his health than for his car. Uh, but he is continuing to recover and, as I said, he did hope to be here today. And his wife, Daphne Benno, sent this message through yesterday to Jeff Verco of the Primary Club. It reads as follows. Dear Jeff, thank you for your phone message and Richie is progressing well, if painfully, under medical treatment. He hopes the Primary Club and the Cauliflower Club and their guests have a terrific lunch tomorrow. Kindest regards from both of us, Daphne. So we uh, indeed appreciate that message. She doesn't mention the current health of the car but I'm sure that'll be Richie's first concern when he's back on his feet. We, of course, wish him well, and we do hope to hear him back in the commentary box throughout the summer. We are privileged to have with us here today wheelchair rugby athlete Andrew Edmondson, who will be coming up to share his story and tell us of his feats on the court and reconfirm for us perhaps how important sport has been in his life. First though, a couple of notes for anyone unfamiliar with this venue. The bathrooms are out the door and to your left. Uh, any smokers who haven't kicked the habit, uh, you'll need to head upstairs and up the escalators outside to the street to indulge. And I just wanted to mention our Twitter handles for today. Uh, we'll have them on screen in just a moment. Uh, we'd like you to get involved and, and, and share the conversation about this luncheon. And the hashtags are backs do it best or hashtag forwards do it best. 
Uh, I'm sure Peter Fitzsimons can tell us who does it best, but uh, I'll leave that for him. That is enough for the preamble. For the latest on the Cauliflower Club, its activities, and to officially welcome you, please welcome to the stage a multi-talented media man, author of many wonderful tomes, including the newly released Ned Kelly, father, husband, former Wallaby, who today appears in one of his finest roles, the President, Thank Mr Peter Fitzsimons. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And can we have a big round of applause for Stephanie Brantz, who's very kindly uh, doing this today. Thank you. It is uh, Your Excellency, Marie, Professor Marie Bashir. thank you so much for coming, and Sir Nicholas and Premier O'Farrell with his wife, Rosemary. We're honoured to have so many of you here today. The Cauliflower Club has had a terrific year. We've, had, uh, we've got 500 members. We've raised a lazy 50 grand. We'll announce later on uh, 25 grand disbursement, our first 25 grand going out. For those who have joined late, the essence of the idea uh, came from one of my readers, in fact, and Nick Farr Jones and I sort of got it going. The three guys that have done all the work, Andrew Purchase, is Andrew Purchase here somewhere? Where is Andrew Purchase? It's so, so, so hard working, Andrew Purchase. Kerry Henry, Moose Moore, Jeff, and two others, Jeff Verko and Doug Woods, have really worked so hard. And uh, as I say, the essence of the idea is to get rugby people in the one room at the one time and uh, be rugby's answer to the primary club. We at the Cauliflower Club believe rugby to be the finest game in the world. We think it is the most inclusive of all games. What, if you want to be a basketballer, you've got to be very tall and very skilled. If you want to be a shot putter, you've got to be huge. If you want to be a sprinter, you've got to be very fast. Rugby says if you're short and fat and squat and have got absolutely no hand-eye coordination whatsoever, you can be a prop. If you're, if you're built like a thermometer and you're totally egotistical and you think the whole world's all about you, you're out on the wing. <laughs> if, you've got, if you're a total narcissist and it's all about having a discernible part in your hair at all possible times, you're a 5 8 If you're hard-working, driving, good-looking debonair, you're in the front row. And uh, if you're very, very good, you're in first. If you're very, very bad, you're in sixth. But it's all about inclusiveness. And uh, rugby's made huge strides in recent times. We've got uh, women's rugby taking off, which is fantastic. In Sydney, gay rugby is fantastic. We'll have a bit about Bing the Bingham Cup uh, a little later on. Off the field, I must say props have had a fairly good time. The, the worst nightmare of the backs is when for props to take over the world. Well, they're taking over Australia. If you look at Tony Abbott, Joe Hockey and Malcolm Turnbull, all lower grade Sydney University props, and they've pretty much taken over Australia. Um, Joe Hockey, a particularly dear friend of mine, and played with, played with Nick and I. I might say my proud boast used to be that when, uh, when I die, Joe will be one of the eight men carrying my coffin. When he dies, I'll be one of the 24 men carrying his. Um, <laughs> That does not work quite as well as it used to, that joke, given that Joe's now lost 31 kegs, but we're honoured to have Joe as our uh, vice patron behind Sir Nicholas, who is our most revered patron. Part of the tradition, part of the idea of putting all the people in the one room at the one time is later on that the, basically if you're a back here, at one point the back has to buy the forward a drink, part of the tradition, and to say, listen, it's about all those years ago when we used to play I just want to thank you for the hard yards you put in, the scraps that you were up the front that I was out the back, the mud, the grit, the gore that you had to go through for the glory for we backs. I just want to say thank you, at which point he offers the drink and the forward has to say, get away from me, you girl. <laughs> or something like that, but with great respect. But in that tradition, could I... Uh, I invite, I'm just about to invite, uh, we, again part of our tradition is that one of the backs will make a, a toast to all the forwards in the room and the one we picked for this year is a great friend of mine and a great, great friend of Australian rugby, a great man of Australian rugby, uh, Robbie Deans, who we're honoured to have here today. I was, I was a great critic of Robbie becoming Wallaby coach, I've since been convinced by, uh, since been convinced by my, many of my friends that I was wrong to oppose Robbie becoming coach. It's actually just lovely to see a Kiwi living in Australia with a job. <laughs> and, and, and again, again, that joke worked pretty well up until six or seven weeks ago as well. <laughs> but, 
But Robbie is a, a great rugby man, and I would invite Robbie to come to the podium to make a toast from the backs to the forwards, at which point the Premier of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell, a former forward prop, will, will make reply. Please welcome to the podium, Robbie Deans. We need it. Robbie's got to have a glass. Oh, yeah. You've got to make a toast. We'll get you one. We'll get you one. We'll get you one. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for the welcome. It is indeed a privilege to be asked to fulfil this function. Uh, to give you an insight into my career, my first year of uh, first class rugby was 1979, and at that stage there were four seats on the bus where nobody sat. Behind that was the forwards, in front was the backs, and you faced the front. And you only spoke to a forward if you were invited to do so. If you're lucky, you get an invitation down the back of the bus where all the refreshments were held. <laughs> Todd Blackadder once said, described me as, as a, uh, a forward in a back's body. I'm still not clear on what he meant by that, so <laughs> I come to these functions to try and enlighten myself on, on the meaning in that. But um, where, the me where the word forwards came from is interesting. Um, I was going to look up Greg Rowden's book of Rugby for Dummies before I came, but we've shifted and haven't unpacked it yet. But, uh, some would suggest, possibly some of us who, who play behind the forwards, that uh, it emanated from the fact that uh, four words was the full extent of the, the forwards <laughs> vocab. The forwards would suggest to you that forwards is their title because they move forward towards contact, where backs move backwards away from contact to avoid it. But without any doubt, when you think about forwards, you think of people like Fitzy, when you think of backs, you think of players like Campo, Mark Eller, and of course Fitzy and Campo have played 108 tests between them. <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't told you that already. But, <laughs> but Fitzy, you know, when you look at Fitzy, you see a man whose face has been contorted by a career being blindsided, king hit by pint-sized French midfield backs <laughs> to the extent where the editor of Clio actually saw something that she liked in him. Without a doubt, this is the greatest game ever invented. Okay, for all shapes and sizes, as Fitzy alluded to, regardless of your level of, of skill, competence, whether you can catch, pass, whether you've got a sense of humour or not, there's a job for you in rugby. And there's no doubt that we, within rugby, are much better for the fact that there are forwards. They contribute a huge amount to the humour of the game. <laughs> so it is my privilege. Congratulations to, to the initiative uh, of the Cauliflower Club and, and all the work that goes on behind the scenes. It is a great cause. So dig deep, commit, and uh, it's my privilege to offer a toast to the forwards, all of those who have played in the backs at any point. If you could stand, please. <laughs> Charge your glass and concede that the game is much better for having forwards. Uh, forwards. Thank you. Please, w please thank Robbie Deans. And to make reply, please welcome to the podium a former forward, the Premier of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell. Thank you. Um, thank you, Peter, uh, Your Excellency, Sir Nicholas, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, including uh, a table of my parliamentary colleagues. Uh, I was told it was a table of nationals and one Liberal MP, it actually, the good news is the number of Liberals has doubled, but we seem to have picked up an independent as well, so thanks Greg Piper for coming along, that's a great sign for the future of New South Wales. Um, Peter, um, uh, you know, you are amazing, uh, it's the first time I've seen you in years without the bandana, <laughs> but your head's just as red.
But he, but he, is, a, he is a good bloke. He, he writes, with all due respect to Jim Maxwell, who's blogging a book at the moment, he, he writes, uh, he's Sydney's best storyteller. There's no doubt about that. Um, so he's not completely stupid. Um, <laughs> even though when there are such significant forwards in the room, he invites me to get up uh, to do the toast. Uh, can I just let you in on a secret? We have uh, 10 other MPs here tonight, today, lunchtime. What time is it? Yes, lunchtime. You've got the Premier of the State. Peter, I'm officially a galah. Now, my wife's known that for years. I suspect there's a few people in my political career who recognise that, but yesterday I became the proud recipient of a, of a pair of Galar rugby shorts from the Galagan Bone Rugby Club. Because I've got to say, Peter, Galagan Bone is the best place name in New South Wales. And so, you know, they, they did me the honour not just of, give, not, not of giving me a jersey, because no one's sure about what size jersey I'll get into, but um, by giving me a pair of shorts, and I'm delighted about that. Peter, you're not all stupid because we know that you married an incredibly attractive and intelligent woman. And some of us were there the other night when, uh, when Lisa delivered that great Andrew Olley lecture, and we all scratched our heads about the fact that she was married to you. <laughs> but it just proves that opposites do attract. I'm not saying, I'm not saying Peter's completely stupid, but I did, I did have... This is going to be a toast to the forwards, Peter. The, I did have a Chinese meal with him recently and he complained that the noodles were crunchy and the waiter said, you're eating the chopsticks. <laughs> now, Sir Nicholas, I'm not going to pick on you. I wouldn't pick on the vice-regal partner. But Sir Nicholas, the governor, Rosemary and I shared a wonderful concert at the Opera House to celebrate the 40th anniversary of that magnificent building. And Your Excellency, I know that on the night you too understood that it was a complete fraud on the people of New South Wales, the Danes and the country. Because the celebration seemed to be that, uh, about Danish architecture. Indeed, Pete, we had your favourite people there. The Danish royals were there. Peter's a great monarchist. The <laughs> it seemed to be about celebrating Jörn Utzon's uh, great design, a design that we're told was not based, as people think, on sales but on orange peel, when in fact, as anybody knows, it is actually an international tribute to rugby. <laughs> it, is, it is a sculpture. It is a sculpture celebrating the game they play in heaven because it's clearly a flock of nuns packing down in a rugby scrum. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So look, I simply, as someone who, who <laughs> who played about half a dozen games at school in Darwin, where it was bloody hot, where I was bigger than Joe Hockey ever was. Uh, and therefore, Pete, your words about the game are right. You can always find a place for somebody, and if you're completely hopeless, sometimes they tuck you into the front row. Uh, but I want to make the point that uh, whilst backs have a great opinion of themselves, whilst there are many forwards who thought they should have been in the backs, the fact is that it's the forwards, in my view, who are the great finishers. In life, there are those who do the heavy lifting and there are those who do the, the soft stuff. I got that around the wrong way. The backs are the great finishers. <laughs> and so I was thinking on the way here, Your Excellency, of that wonderful Sistine Chapel, the fact that there were many people who put in the grunt work to get, the, uh, to get that scaffolding up, to get the plaster up there, but it was a bloke called Michelangelo who put the finishing touches on it. But, but Your Excellency, he would have been nothing without the heavy lifters. So can I ask, can I ask all of the forwards uh, in the room to stand and toast the backs? <laughs> toast those people who, 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 get the, who get the accolades, who get the accolades of being the finishers, but would be nothing without the forwards of this game. To the backs. Please thank the Premier of New South Wales, Barry O'Farrell. That was Premier a a wonderful, a wonderful toast, and thank you to Robbie Deans. I might say a little disloyal of you. I am the president of Australian Men Punching Well Above Their Weight Club, but I can tell you what: here with your wife Rosemary, you are the vice president, and. <laughs> You are closing fast. Uh, 
So uh, it, it's wonderful too that we have uh, the table of parliamentarians here. Thank you so much for coming. It is uh, long it's not surprising that Barry O'Farrell should be a rugby man, nor that uh, the Prime Minister should be a rugby man. It has long staggered me how wide the writ of rugby has run, how people who've made their fame in other fields actually have it in their background. Where Nick Farr Jones and I went on to the midday show in 1993, we we're about to go out to launch the biography I'd written on Nick, and Ray Martin's in the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to put your hands together. Wallaby World Cup winning captain Nick Farr Jones. We're just about to go out when in the darkness there's a sudden tug on my sleeve. I turned round, there is the next guest on the show, Meatloaf, the famous bat out of hell singer. And in the darkness he whispers, says, is that, is that Nick Farr Jones? And I turned and said, yes, Mr Loaf. <laughs> Why do you ask? And it was because Meatloaf was a mad keen rugby player, played it in Boston in the early part of the 70s, retained his passion for it ever after. And with that in mind, I began to form up a world rugby 15 of famous people who played the game. I won't take you through the whole lot, merely the most important part, which is of course the forward pack. At loosehead prop, you'd have Meatloaf, not simply because he looked like a loosehead prop, had played at loosehead prop, but how fabulous would the team sing along be on the back of the bus on a Saturday night? At hooker, you need somebody ugly, mean, squat and aggressive. You couldn't go past Benito Mussolini, who played the game in France and was responsible for introducing it to Italy. He'd have his arm around none other than Idi Amin, who represented the Ugandan Test 15 in 1956. I know what you're thinking, that Mussolini and Amin would probably give away a lot of needless scrum penalties. <laughs> In the second row on one side, you've got Frankenstein, a.k.a. Boris Karloff, who established the Southern California Rugby Union in 1934. Next to him, none other than Kerry Francis Bullmore Packer, who played, played for the Geelong Grammar First 15 in uh, 1958. But it is the back row which shows the eclectic nature of rugby. On one side, you've got Che Guevara, the great Cuban revolutionary who played for the San Isidro Club in Buenos Aires, 52 to 56. On the other side, I worry about picking this man because I think his uniform would get in the way. I think he'd be a bit too gentle. Got to get him in any way. Pope John Paul II. <laughs> uh, played in Krakow in Poland in 46 after the war for his seminary. And at number eight, and I think he's basically the hero of the Cauliflower Club overall, of course, Big Bill Clinton, who on a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford University, 68, 69, played rugby, absolutely loved it. Now, admittedly, I've got no idea what sort of a rugby player Bill Clinton would make these days, but by God, he'd be a good man to go on a rugby tour with. <laughs> I, um, I always fancied the scene that after you played the game and went out on the town that night, you'd go to the busiest, most populous bar in town, you'd put Bill Clinton up against the bar and you'd say, now you stand there, Billy boy, and do not move. I am going to run off you all night long. Just before I hand to Stephanie, just one thing, just, I'd just quickly like to acknowledge there's so many wallabies that have come. Could I ask everybody who is a wallaby or an international indeed just to stand so we can give you a quick round of applause. Every, I see Simon Poitivans here, Tim Gavin here, Matt Dunning is here, Johnny Carson. Can you just stand so we can just give you a quick round of applause? Daniel Manu, Anthony Eckhart, Mick Mathers. Thank you. And I think, yes, down, do it now. And, could I just ask Jim Maxwell, to, who's one of the driving forces of the primary club of, of, of Australia, to come forward. Great ABC cricket broadcaster and a great contributor to charity. We just would like to honour that Jim Maxwell in the, in the last year has been given an AO, Order of Australia, for his services to charity well above and beyond the call of duty. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. And I'm sure you've all noticed by now that your uh, entree is fittingly cauliflower soup, so I hope you're enjoying it very, very much. And I have a special treat for you. I have a special treat for you while you're enjoying this. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage a young man with a remarkable story. Andrew Edmondson is a Randwick boy, and it was an afternoon like any other when he went to Coogee Beach after school one day and dove into the water. He dove into a sandbar that day and his life changed forever. To tell us more of his story, please welcome to the stage, wheelchair rugby athlete extraordinaire, Mr. Andrew Edmondson. Now, as Andrew and I get settled here, uh, I'd like you to just have a quick look at the screens and uh, see exactly what this sport that they call murder ball really is. Have a look.
able-bodied rugby players were really tough. Well, we have news for you. That Riley Bat, that was Riley Bat that we just saw in the gold medal match at the London Paras, playing for the Steelers. Uh, Andrew, he's he's quite frightening, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He's uh, by far one of the best players in the world, and thankfully I grew up or with the sport playing against him. So we started about the same time. So I got him before he was, uh, I guess, a complete animal, which was a bit better. But yeah, as, a, as he, you know, we got a bit older in the sport, he's just, um, you know, absolute freak. And uh, you were a flanker uh, in your team before your accident, and obviously your perspective on rugby changed a little. Can you just firstly tell us what, what happened that day? Uh, it was a casual Friday afternoon, just like any. I finished a long day of school. I was only 13 years old at the time. Um, went down to my local beach, uh, Coogee Beach, just after school, and was running down into the water and um, dove in head first and didn't realise that there was a sandbar underneath the water. So as I entered the water, I hit the top of my head on the sandbar and actually shattered two vertebras in my neck. Um, vertebra C5 and 6, just in behind your throat there. And um, since that day was a C5, 6 uh, incomplete quadriplegia. Uh, it was by far the scariest thing that um, has ever happened to you. I was completely conscious of throughout my entire accident. Um, I hit the water and I knew something was, was wrong straight away. I, I was unable to move anything in my body. I was face down in the water and just didn't really know exactly what was going on and, until I kept trying to wake myself up from a dream. Um, little did I know it wasn't a dream and um, a few minutes later I surfaced um, briefly as I think I got rolled over by a wave um, and then was face down again and then that's when it really hit me that I knew something was wrong and and um, obviously face down couldn't yell out for help or, or couldn't do anything for myself and was fortunate enough my brother was there at the same time as me and, and dragged me out of the water after he realised something was wrong. Um, in which time I continued to tell everyone that I was okay and just give me a couple of minutes I'll get back up and it was probably the the longest 40 minute drive from Coogee up to Prince of Wales, which is actually less than a kilometre away, I think. And um, obviously the, the people knew straight away there was something wrong. Um, and not until later that night, um, after I'd done a few scans, did the doctors walk in and um, while I was lying in bed with my parents sitting beside me and, and tell me that um, I'd broke my neck and would most likely be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Um, and from that day, just, as you said, everything in your life changes. But I've heard you say that uh, it was actually a start to a, a whole new life and you've uh, certainly put perspective on having a really rotten day. But uh, I, I'm keen to hear about your mother's perspective that after she goes through that journey, if you like, with you of such a, a, a horrible accident, you then go and play a sport like wheelchair rugby. She must have been thrilled. Uh, thankfully, she, oh, she knew exactly the type of person I was before I had my accident. And as you mentioned before, I played number seven. I played rugby since I could walk. It was everything I wanted to do. Um, my dream was to represent the Wallabies and, and play for Australia. And, um, she knew that before my accident, my, actual, my young coach that, that used to um, uh, coach me when I was about 12, 13, he used to call me Knucklehead. Um, and that was my nickname within the team because I pretty much would go at everything. You know, full steam ahead and, and no regrets. And, Yes, having a spinal injury is very, very life-changing. Um, once I got over, I guess, the hurdles and got back into life, I, I took the same approach and, and didn't let anything hold me back, and particularly in the sporting environment now, nothing, apart from my physical ability, um, nothing has changed that much. My parents, um, obviously a great ordeal. A spinal injury doesn't just affect the person that it happens to, it affects the people around you, the people that are involved with the accident often not just for a certain period of time, but for the rest of their life as well. Um, they experience just as much as you do, particularly at my age, at 13 years old, my parents were you know, still very much caring for me and, and um, very, very hard thing to, to have to go through and I'm very grateful I have a, a, you know, such a good family to support me. And it's wonder wonderful the way sport gave you a new focus and we've spoken of course today about the work that the Cauliflower Club and the Primary Club does uh, to help make that available 
uh, to people with a disability. Uh, what, what I'm keen to hear is you say your life changed in so many ways. I'm imagining that travel changed and I travelled with the ABC as did uh, my colleague Jim Maxwell over to London and uh, the, the travel logistics for the Paralympics particularly are phenomenal. Uh, how does your team go about that when you travel even interstate? Yeah, well, within our New South Wales team, uh, we travel with often eight to, to 12 players. Um, just to have a few reserves and each player obviously has their own wheelchair that they use every day uh, in their own custom-made rugby wheelchair um, which is often weighs 25 30 kilos you have two spare wheels that you travel with you as well and often another large bag that has all your gloves and other equipment so each person is, is traveling you know pretty much you can tie a trailer to the back of your chair and, and take the things with you that's how how much you travel with each time and every player has the same thing you have to um, to compete at that level as we go through, you know, wheels, a lot of wheels and games, and as you can see, it's really full on. So you do um, have a lot of equipment damage and things like that. So when we travel as a team, we have uh, it's almost two thousand dollars excess baggage um, when we travel uh, as part of our team, and we actually travel with a, me a full-time mechanic um, who comes along to each one of our tournaments, uh, a full-time manager, and a full-time carer. Um, and our coach is actually one of our players, so if we had another coach, we'd have another person. But logistically, I'm glad I don't look after that part. So. Now, seriously, you also didn't mention taking any changes of clothes, but I guess that's secondary to all the other paraphernalia that has to come along. Uh, just tell us what you're doing now. I believe you've just finished university. Yeah, that's right. I had finished a three-year degree uh, in sports business um, and actually just took up a job at the Australian Rugby Union. So. I believe Andrew's working in membership, so we're all just about to become his very nearest, dearest, closest friend. Sign up deadlines are today, actually, so jump online. I don't want to join a line. We've got you here. <laughs> uh, tell us quickly, you said that uh, you, at one point, wanted to be a wallaby. Who were your idols? There's a few um, in the room, by the way. When I was uh, very young, actually, I, I'm sure I'm going to get a bit of criticism here, but I was a big fan of Carl Spencer and the way he played. Um, I loved Matt Burke. Um, and then in the forwards, um, oh, one person, obviously Richard McCall was an idol, um, looking at the other teams as well, but just in terms of the way they played, that's how I, I like to think of myself. But um, yeah, I, I actually really thought I'd be a back before I got a bit older and a bit bigger. So I always thought I'd be a back, but I was actually a forward. So my, probably my number one idol uh, in the forward pack, oh, I'm not too sure, I can't even pick one. You're not game enough to pick one here today, no, are you? I'm being very <laughs> careful. I was looking around before to see who stood up, so I dropped it. <laughs> no, let's play it very, very safe. Uh, just last thing before I let you go. Uh, Brazil is coming up 2016 for the Rio Paralympics. Uh, you're touted to be the next big thing in the Steelers and potentially with captain potential. What's your plans? Um, look, it's definitely a goal of mine. I'd love to be there. It is my goal now. I finished uni and a few things have falling into place so as of the next couple of years I'll be dedicating pretty much most of my time to, to get on the, the team to travel to, to the Paralympics and um, yeah look captaining is another thing I'd like to just be on the team first and, and see how I go. At this stage I, I captain uh, New South Wales but uh, we'll see how we go in terms of Australia but yeah look a definite goal of mine I really hope to be there in 2016. I have no doubt we'll see you there. Absolutely. Please thank Andrew Edmondson. All the very best for the future. Thank you. I'd just like to particularly thank you, thank the primary club, which is sort of our umbrella body. And the essence of the primary club is they give $5.00. Their members give $5 every time a test batsman give, gets a golden duck. So we've got 500 members who give 50 bucks every time a uh, front rower in the Wallabies gets a try. So you haven't had to pay much in the last year. I think you're probably pretty safe for the next 10 years. But uh, no, we've had one. But uh, anyway, we're just going to do a quick game of heads and tails. If I could just ask everybody to quickly stand up. And you, un you understand the game. I'll, I'll explain it very quickly. We're going to ask rugby questions. If you can put something that crinkles on... Ex Your Excellency, don't you stand up. And Sir Nicholas, don't you stand up. No, you're fine. If everybody else... We just, if you could put something that crinkles on the table. $5 note, scrap of uh, a receipt, anything. $50 note, whatever. And our prize is some Italian wines. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask rugby questions, left or right, and you've got to choose. But before we do that, let's just get rid of all of the unlucky ones, okay? We're going to get rid of everybody here who's unlucky. So I'm going to toss a coin, put your hands on your heads or hands on your tails for what it's going to be, okay? The unlucky ones are those that have got their hands on their tails. You sit down, you're wiped out. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. On the 5th of August 1994, George Gregan pulled off an amazing tackle on Jeff Wilson. Simon Poitovan was commentating that game. Was Jeff Wilson on the right, as he faced the post, was he on the right hand side of the field or the left hand side of the field? Put your right hand up or your left hand up quickly. Simon, where are you? Simon, what was it? Yes, he was on the right hand side. So if you've got left hand side, sit down. Okay, Tim Gavin. Yeah, put the money in the what? Okay, there's a pouch in the middle of the table if you put the money in that. Go on, Simon. Okay, <clears throat> next question. The, uh, the touch judge, the touch judge on that side of the field that night is in the room. Ah. And uh, he played for either Sydney University or the University of New South Wales. Did you talk about Wayne Erickson? <laughs> Well, I, well, they can't. They can't do right or left on Wayne Erickson. How are they going to do that? All right. Got another one? No, okay, no, I'll do no. this. No, I'll no, do no, this. No, 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 stop. No, no. Stop. No. No. I'll do this. Is Simon Poitovan right-handed or left-handed? Quickly decide. Keep your hands down. Is Simon Poitovan right-handed or left-handed? Okay. Hand up. Which one? Right-handed. We got rid of a few. Thank you. We got rid of a few. Okay. Tim Gavin. One of the greatest number eights for the Wallabies. I'm just making this up from memory. But Tim Gavin, in 1991, just before the World Cup, I think it was, Tim ruptured either his right knee or his left knee. Is Tim still in the room there somewhere? Where is Tim down there? Is his Tim there? Okay, so, did, so Tim ruptured either his right knee or his left knee. So lift up your right knee or your left knee quickly. Except you, Tim. Okay, Tim, which one was it? Right or left? Right knee. Okay. The Prime Minister, okay, and on these, a few of these questions, on a few of these questions, it's not what's right or wrong, it's what I think is right or wrong. Okay. The Prime Minister in, in, the, in the 5th of September 1985 knocked out the Treasurer on Sydney University Oval. There was a blue between scrums. Did the Prime Minister, who was an Oxford blue, hit him out with a right hook or a left hook? Tony Abbott knocked out Joe Hockey. Right hook or left hook? Okay. I think it was a left hook. I've interviewed him about it. I think it was a left hook. So sit down if you're wrong. Okay. Michael Liner, Nick Farr Jones, you don't. Okay, you're, you can't win anyway. So you're. Okay, you're, you're banned. Okay. Michael Liner, we did this one last year, but I'll do it again. Michael Liner used to always line up the posts and he used to always go like this, like this, like this and wipe his brow just before he hit the winning goal. Was his last stroke on his brow, and if you actually know the answer to this, you've actually got to get out more. <laughs> was his last stroke with his right brow or his left brow? Quit this quick. No, no, scrape your brow. You've got to do your brow like Michael Liner. There we go. Nick, what's the answer? What do you... Th no, no, you've got to stand up. All uh, right, okay, last one was right, okay? Okay, all right, we've just got to have a quick cull, get rid of more unlucky ones. Heads or tails, unlucky ones are gone. Unlucky ones are gone. Unlucky ones have got heads. Oh. What have we got left? Okay, just very quickly. Okay, this is what I think, very quickly. Two Tai Kefu, okay? Last test of John Eels, the inspector gadget. We all remember, okay? Two Tai Kefu. He was tackled 40 metres out from the line. They all jumped upon him, and two Tai Kefus. Inspector Gadget hand, either right or left, went out with the hand in the ball in the hand, went out 40 metres and planted it between the posts. Did he do it with his right? Daniel, do you know the answer, Daniel Manu? Okay, um, you, you can give the answer for two Tai Kefu. Okay, so was it with his right hand, Inspector Gadget right hand, or Inspector Gadget left hand? Quick, right or left? Daniel, right. So we lost, just lost left. So it was right, left goes, puts the hand down. We're going to have to be quick here. 
Okay, unlucky ones gone, unlucky ones are gone. Heads or tails, quick. Unlucky ones are with the heads. Now, how many have we got left? Okay, unlucky ones are gone, heads or tails. Tails, everybody goes down. I think that's our winner. Is that, oh no, we've got two left. We've got two left, we've got two left. Go, you stay, quick. How many have we got left? Okay, Nick Farr Jones, is he right handed or left handed? <laughs> Nick? Yes? No, don't lie, don't lie. He's right handed. We haven't got rid of anybody there. Okay, Anthony Eckert. Does he, uh, Anthony Eckert. Does he get out on the right hand side of the bed or the left hand side of his bed? <laughs> and Mrs. Eckert is not allowed to answer if she's here. Okay, Anthony, right hand or left hand? Just go opposite to him. Okay, Anthony, right or left? Right. You win. <laughs> Stephanie Branch, thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Fitzsimons. That was the most exact science uh, of a heads and tails I've ever seen in my life. Very well done. Uh, ladies and gents, you may be aware that currently there is a, a, a tour test being played at the SCG where England's playing a selected Australian 11. And uh, the gentleman that we saw up here being presented with uh, acknowledgement of his achievements just earlier, Mr. Jim Maxwell, is at some point, if the rain stops, going to have to run off and commentate that match. But before he goes, we'd like to invite him up just to have a few quick, quick words to us. Please welcome him to the stage, Mr. Jim Maxwell. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the uh, set of, fine set of binoculars, I think, is in that case, Fitzy. That's very kind of you. Terrific. Um, just while I'm up here shortly, just want to acknowledge this connection that there is between the primary club and the cauliflower club. Now, the basis of donation is a bit contrary, and you might want to think about this, because the primary club gets its money basically because of failure, the failure of Australia's batsmen to get any runs, whereas the Cauliflower Club occasionally gets some money when a prop forward uh, scores a try. So I need someone to come up with what is the Cauliflower uh, Club's definition, what is the rugby equivalent of a primary? What is a primary in the game of rugby? Because if you can come up with that, is it Will Genia having a kick charge down again? What is it? Playing for the Rebels. <laughs> it's probably a back with a three-man overlap being dumped rather than giving the ball, something like that. Uh, you've got to come up with something so we can find another way of getting a little bit more money out of the Cauliflower Club because it's pretty rare for a prop forward to be scoring a try. Um, remember that every cent that is donated with the Primary Club and the Cauliflower Club goes to where it should. And there are lots of good causes connected with that. Particularly, I'd like to mention the, uh, the Sarwood Centre, uh, which Rod McQueen is very heavily involved with. And that's a very important part of, of what is going on with the Cauliflower Club in terms of the rehabilitation of those with spinal injuries. Now, just to raise a little bit more money today, I want to auction this book. Uh, Stephanie Brance has written in it. I've written in it, actually. A lot of people have. It's about unsung sporting heroes. Now, just to get you going, at coffee this morning with my friend over there, John Tierney, before I got any autographs in this, he put up $200, thank you, John, uh, for this book. Since then, I've managed to get a few autographs. Thank you very much to Her Excellency, the Governor of New South Wales, Marie Bashir, a great sports follower, probably the only person in this room who saw Don Bradman score his uh, 100th hundred at the SCG when she was a schoolgirl. So she's, she's got that claim to fame amongst many others. Uh, Sir Nicholas Shahady, of course, is here. Uh, Robbie Deans. Um, I'll pick up Jonathan Agnew this morning. Stephanie Brantz is in here. Uh, as I mentioned, Robbie Deans. Who else is in here? Phil Jakes, Jeff Lawson. And you can get a few more autographs once you've bought it. So who'd like to give me a, a much, much bigger offer than 200 bucks for this uh, first edition of unsung uh, sporting heroes. Someone give me three or four hundred and we're out of here. 500, that's very good. Anyone can top 500? Going once, twice sold. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Jim Maxwell, and all the best with the commentary. And hopefully, the contractual negotiators at the ABC work their stuff out, so we'll hear you from the Gabba next week as well. And can I just make it clear that when Jim said I'd written in his book, I've actually written a story in the book. I didn't scribble in his book, and it's actually a, a, it's a wonderful story. Well, I think it's a wonderful story about one of our gold medal winning Paralympians. So uh, there's, there's many, many great tales in that book. And on that note, can I just mention that we have uh, two other gold medal Paralympians in the room today, uh, Annabelle Williams and Ellie Cole on table 48. Great to have you here, ladies. All right, now I'd like to call to the stage the gentleman that won the heads and tails because you never came to get your wine and it's, uh, it's sitting here. Please come up. Uh, let's give him a warm round of applause as well as the sponsors who supplied that wine, the Italian wine importers who provided not just this wine but the wine that went to Mr. Jim Maxwell as well. Congratulations, sir. And while he's making his way over, would you please put your hands together also for a man of outstanding achievement on the rugby field, named Australian captain at the tender age of just 25, IRB and ARU Hall of Famer, Vice President of the Cauliflower Club, and very stressed man because he's got a son sitting in the HSC. Please welcome Mr Nick Farr-Jones. Thank you, Steph, and thank you, Steph, for uh, running our proceedings today. Uh, Her Excellency, um, Sir Nicholas, our patron, Premier, Rosemary, um, Pete, President, and Jim, who's president of the Primary Club. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, we kicked it off last year and the, the Premier was here for the kickoff um, ceremony at the lunch up at the Sheraton on the park. And it's fantastic that people just want to come along. If you're not a member yet, I don't think we've sort of um, pushed hard the membership, but if you're not a member, plenty of people running around who would love to sign you up. My, my role here to, today is really just to finish things off. I think people who came to the, the uh, inaugural lunch that we had last year realise that part of the, what we hope is the enjoyment of, of today is just, as Pete said, getting old rugby people back together, rubbing shoulders and, um, and just being able to talk. So we don't want to extend lunches and what have you, but there's a couple of announcements that we want to have as we, we close the lunch. Um, are we, we going to show the, the Robinson try, Fitz? Is that, is that sort of coming up? Because what the Robinson try um, actually contributed was about $25,000 to our stocks. And, and it's um, against Argentina. And it's enabled us to make our, our first grant. And I'm going to introduce a, a good doctor friend of mine to come up and talk in a second. But before I did that, I just thought, when we talk about front row um, forward tries. I've got to think that, and I think it's Tony Daly in the room, my old teammate who was there. No, he's not here. Um, Dales was actually awarded the try back in 91. We're going to go. I think we're going to throw Jeff to the, to the fantastic, spectacular try. Australia versus Argentina. from the Wallabies, we're not used to seeing that. That's two in a row, they forced trouble. And Genia goes in digging. Foley, oh, he tried to pass on the inside, so went backwards fortuitously. Tomani was there. We've got Tomani and Tomani on there. And Hooper! Hooper! Michael Hooper stepping. They wrap him up now. Two or three metres out. Tabani can't get it down. Jania Robinson! Big Ben is over. That cut is back. He deserved that. I don't know if you saw him pre-scrum, but he had Ben Mullen, who was on about pushing behind him in the scrum. He kept grabbing his shoulders.
Bravo, $25,000 in the, uh, the coffers. Just quickly taking you back to, to 91. Some of you remember 22 years ago. Um, fantastic to beat the Poms in that final, but one of the, the downers was that we got one lousy try. Uh, it was scored by a, a front rower. I, I suppose to set the scene very quickly, we had the great escape against the Irish in the, in the quarterfinal in Dublin. When you talk about great tries, I think about the semi-final against the All Blacks. Um, Campo, Bob Dwyer, our coach, always said, no one runs a cross field in my team. If anyone runs a cross field, you get dropped. I heard Campo's voice coming from the right wing, running absolutely perfectly lateral, um, <laughs> running across left, and, and he went after All Black defender, All Black defender, All Black defender to score in the corner. And who will ever forget the one that he, Campo put over his shoulder to Tim Horan for our second try. Fast forward to, to Twickenham in the final. Um, back in the amateur days, guys, I, I, I always remember how I was amazed that, and Poito will remember this too, Gav should have been there, but we just heard about the injury. Um, I was amazed how people were interested back home about the team. Gordon Bray came up to me, the ABC commentator at the time, said, we're doing 21s, 22s in Sydney and Brisbane, which you might expect at one or two in the morning, but unbelievably we're doing in places like Melbourne, um, Adelaide, Perth, 18s and 19s. I mean, thousands of people were sitting up. We got to London for the final. They put in six fax machines. Remember the days of fax machines just to cope with the demand. And, and I remember the four or five days leading to the final, a lot of excitement, but we, the team, couldn't believe that so many faxes were arriving overnight. You know, sort of one and two thousand. We, we made a point of dividing them up around breakfast. You know, 50, 100, we read them all. One came from an Adelaide lady. She wrote a page and a half. She said early on in the fax that she was a good looking young 21 year old by her girlfriend's admission. She went on to talk about how she knew nothing about rugby, couldn't understand the laws. I've got to say, I've been playing the game for a long time and I sympathise with her. Um, but she went on to say, talk about the spirit of the Wallabies and the great escape against the Irish. And the final paragraph, she said, for the scorer of the first try in the final against the Poms, there is a promise of sexual favour. <laughs> so that fax went right in the middle of the Wallabies notice board. I remember sitting to Bob, my coach, going to training, I think it was the Thursday morning, Wondering, because we had a lot of young guys back in that team, um, are the guys going to be focused? I mean, this is a big event for us. <laughs> I don't know how many people sat up at 1 and 2 in the morning on the 2nd of November, 22 years ago, but we got one lousy try in that final. Um, when you pull on the gold jersey, you love to score tries from 40 and 50 metres out, interchange between forwards and backs, multi-phase play. Our try came from a five metre line out. Um, Kernsey, Kernsey had come into the team two years beforehand. He quickly became known as Lightning, because as with his line out throwing, it never struck in the same place twice. <laughs> but he actually got this one right. Slaughter McCall, chairman of Queensland Rugby now, Rod McCall, was calling li the line outs, and um, believe it or not, he, he actually called to number five in the line out. Willie Offerhen Galway, Willie O was our number five. Willie jumped up perfectly, like his game was, always perfect. Brought the ball down, the gold mass came in behind. So the rolling mall crashed over for the most unspectacular of rugby tries, but it was the only try in that final and it won us the Rugby World Cup. You know, I remember looking, who scored it? You know, the ball connected Link, Ewan McKenzie and, and Dales. It was almost like an umbilical cord. And eventually the try was awarded to Dales and we got back to quite amazing scenes. Premier, I, I must say that, that I actually phoned Nick Griner, who was the Premier back in those days, and I said, sir, because he decided to put on a ticker tape parade. I mean, that doesn't happen in 91. It doesn't happen for rugby. He said, Nick, we've announced it. We're going to have it. I thought 200 people would turn up, you know, Dave Brock off my parents, you know, throwing <laughs> toilet paper at us. I don't know if anyone was there, but unbelievably, you know, 120,000 people turned up that day, they reckon. And it was phenomenal for us to come back. But when I think back to who was actually awarded that try, Dales, never surprised me. We never heard from that Adelaide lady again. <laughs> Sorry to the front rowers in the room. As I said, um, one of the great things about it, and it was Pete's idea to, to, to form the Cauliflower Club. The, the, the program, the, the vision is to, 
to get all the states on board, and a lot of work's been done. Peter mentioned the board, of, and, and they have done fantastic work. Um, but the vision is to get all the states on board. We want to get the membership up to about $2,000 so that one of the beauties is that we can have simple lunches, we can get together as, as mates. I see the whales have got together, and, and that's the idea. Rugby people, club people, professional, amateur, um, front rowers, greyhound wingers, just getting together, the, the inclusiveness of the game. But um, the plan is that when you know, front rowers score tries, that all of a sudden we bring together a bunch of money, easy money to raise, um, to, to, to be able to contribute to fantastic causes. We received our first application, not our first application, but the first successful application, and uh, we awarded a grant of $25,000. Um, and just to quickly talk about that and to explain where that money's gone, um, old friend of mine, Dr. David Joffe, who's a respiratory specialist at the Royal North Shore Hospital. Please welcome him, Dr. Joff, come up. Our first successful applicant. Uh, just tell us a bit about what you do at Royal North Shore Hospital, what the Premier has to do, refunding equipment. <laughs> I, I promised I'd be polite, Nick. Um, I'm a lung doctor, um, and I uh, am charged with looking after respiratory failure as part of my job. And for me, that's the most important part, really, um, because if you don't breathe, you go to God. And in particular... Uh, don't, don't say that. Peter's here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you, you, you go to the front row. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for some years, um, we've struggled to provide meaningful services to uh, those with high spinal injury. And... There's a huge difference between those who end up with a permanent tracheostomy uh, and those who are capable of being transmissioned or transferred to uh, other forms of ventilation like nasal ventilation who can really go home and live a normal life in the community. The cost to society and the benefit to the individual is frankly immeasurable. And so for some years we've uh, as one of the two spinal hospitals in this country, have really strived to uh, provide to the spinal injured people and those with neuromuscular disease, children with spinal muscular atrophy, Duchenne's, a whole bunch of really miserable conditions. The opportunity to be adequately ventilated in the community um, so that they can actually have a life and have a quality of life. Unfortunately, these things don't come cheaply at all. Uh, and so we uh, set up a special facility at Royal North Shore Hospital called the Respiratory Special Care Unit, which has taken me a, just a short 20 years to evolve. Um, and with that, we can take these people with high ventilation needs, complicated people from ICU, and provide to them meaningful... Uh, ventilation, transition them back into the community um, and to really make a difference. But it comes at a huge cost. The ventilators are hugely expensive. The monitors are very expensive. Everything in healthcare is very expensive and uh, with all due respect to the Premier, I mean there is no money in health, uh, least of all for spinal injuries and uh, chronic illness. And so I was blessed by an introduction to, to Nick and Charlotte Waddy, who's not here today, uh, who uh, decided instead of giving me a bottle of red for fixing their asthma, they'd uh, raise money for me. <laughs> I sometimes think I should have taken the red, really. <laughs> Dr. Joff, just quickly, I mean, the foundation, we're going to have a rugby thing, but we've got to, we've got yeah. to, we told these people, give them a beer outside. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, no, I know, I know, but... Um, the, the main purpose of the, the funding that Nick has offered us is... Um, no, the, the Cauliflower Club, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> quickly. The... <laughs> Was he always this impatient at the back of the scrum? <laughs> The, the Cauliflower Club have, have offered us $25,000 under the umbrella of the primary club to provide us with two 
very sophisticated uh, remote sleep monitoring uh, devices. That allows us the uh, ability to take these devices to the spinal unit, to intensive care, to the respiratory special care unit, to more adequately monitor and determine what kind of ventilation these people are going to need so that we can actually do our job better, more quickly and more efficiently. Dr Joffe, report back on how the equipment goes. Thank you very much. Is Porto still here? Is, is Simon still here? Porto, um, I asked David about your great mate, Evan Fraser, who we lost. Evan, Evan, many people in this room would know who suffered a spinal injury um, playing rugby. I think Simon, one of your sons, is, Evan was his godfather and what have you, but, but Joff said if, if that equipment was available back then when Evan suffered his injury, life would have been a lot easier. So I was really comforted to know that. We're going to move on very quickly because Fitzsimons has given me the wind up, but next year, Sydney's biggest sporting event is something we, we in rugby should all be aware of. Uh, I'm going to, as we throw to a video in, in 30 seconds, I'm going to ask uh, just to come up and talk to us a little bit about this biggest event, the sporting event that Sydney will hold. A wonderful man, a guy who without Peter and I couldn't um, hope to get the cauliflower club up. His name is Andrew Purchase. He was the original founder of the Sydney Convicts, which is the holder of the World Cup for Gay Rugby. Um, he's also the president of the Bingham Cup for Sydney. Please welcome Andrew as we throw to the video. Welcome everyone to the Bingham Cup Sydney 2014 launch. One of the great things about rugby is the internationality of the game. You've got a, a gay community from right around the world coming in, 40 different teams. I mean, this is actually the essence of the game. They can expect some tough rugby uh, against ourselves, truly, but also an experience of a lifetime. It's a city where they'll find that people are so friendly, welcoming, uh, and we'll be, we'll be looking to, to show everybody a good time here. Gay men can play rugby just as hard as any straight man. We are delighted to um, make the commitment that we are going to be working on an inclusion policy immediately. We want to do everything we can to eliminate any discrimination or any homophobia. To know now that mainstream rugby is getting behind us and saying no to homophobia in sport is just fantastic. And this is where the Bingham Cup, I think, is an enormously important statement. And who knows, it might coincide with some legislative changes. It just brings recognition and um, you know attention to gay sports and in fact at the end of the day it's sports played by gay people which let's be honest isn't that big of a deal. We think that we're going to put on a show that will be very hard to beat. Oh wow I think well Sydney's kind of known as a bit of a party town isn't it and there'll be some playing some popping and there'll be definitely some partying in this town. We make our international guests very welcome they will have a wonderful time all those Gorgeous, fabulous footballers <laughs> in our community. You've got to be in it to win it. If you're not here, you won't know what you're missing. So get your asses here. video came from the launch of the Bingham Cup which was held at Parliament House up on Macquarie Street um, a few months ago. It was a fantastic thing. Andrew, congratulations. I know there was a lot of blood, sweat and tears that went into winning that and, and, and as I said, it is going to be at the moment Sydney's biggest sporting event in, in 2014. 40 teams coming out. Just talk us through though, you were the founder of the, the Convicts. What, what motivated you to do that? Uh, I played in the first Bingham Cup uh, in San Francisco. It was named after a guy called Mark Bingham who died on September 11th. He was in the plane that crashed in the field in Philadelphia. Remember there were four planes, two of them went in the World Trade Center and one went into the Pentagon and the fourth plane was the last one flying. And so the people in that plane knew that um, the other three had met the demise they'd met. And so they knew that they had to do something about it. So Mark and three others took over the plane and made a crash basically. And he played for the San Francisco team called the San Francisco Fog and um, they took a, there was a tournament in his honour in 2002 and I played in that with the San Francisco team and 
that time I saw how important it was to these guys to be able to play rugby. A lot of them hadn't had the chance to play team sport before, either because it's difficult in the US to have to get that team sport opportunity because if you're not playing elite level sport by the time you're in high school you don't get to play, and also because they were gay. So I, when I came back to Australia I saw how fantastic that experience was and we, need, we, we really needed to take a team to play in the next BM Cup, which was in London in 2004. And San Francisco, there were six teams. In London, there were 18 teams. And since then, it's been to New York, Dublin, Minneapolis. And last year in Manchester, there were over 40 teams from all from 16 countries. That's fantastic. <laughs> and um, as Fitzy gives us our running sheet, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch about, I mean, it's August next year. We know 40 teams are coming down. We know it's going to be a big celebration. Um, Fitz has given you your instructions, what you've got to say or something. But, but talk us through a little bit about the tournament and do you need volunteers and do you need support? Yeah, we need volunteers. We need money. The state government has been, uh, has been quite generous uh, as well, which is great. And the governor has also, she's become patron of the event, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. We've got ambassadors from... Ambassadors from the ARU, from the NRL, from the A-League and also from, um, from the AFL supporting the cause. We're having 40 teams playing rugby over three days down in Wallara. Uh, we were struggling actually to find a tagline for the tournament. Uh, but then fortunately Nick came up and gave us the answer. And it was, gay rugby, it only hurts at first. <laughs> I reckon... Well guys, I reckon we'll sell them. Hundreds of T-shirts. The, the pink and purple logo. Gay yeah, rugby. It only hurts at first. Well, what was it? 2003. 2003. Out when we hosted the World Cup, and I think the USA played Japan, and, and some guy printed 500 T-shirts that went like that. The game was up at Gosford. It was something like 19. I might get the dates wrong. 41. Pearl Harbor, Japan. Um, 1944. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, it was Hiroshima, the USA, you know, 2003 Gosford, the decider. Um, <laughs> well, my brother came up with a logo for the back of the t-shirt. Gay rugby, where rugs and malls have no time limit. <laughs> but just, final question, Andrew, quickly. I mean, Bill, Bill Pulver was... Bill Pulver was there as our new Chief Executive of Australian Rugby. I mean, he, he said that we want to move in the right direction in sport and certainly in rugby. To um, you know, to make sure the inclusiveness of our game is complete. I mean, have you followed up with Bill in, in relation to yes. what the ARU is doing? So the ARU is fantastic. They've um, they've uh, agreed to initiate an anti-homophobia policy, and in fact, we've got a uh, we got a presentation at the ARU early next month where we're handing over the Bingham Cup to them. It's a huge piece of silverware, and we're giving them to mine the Bingham Cup because it's the only piece of silverware they've got. <laughs> so they've got a. They've got a very big cabinet with nothing in it, so we're going to give them the BM Cup to mind. But uh, it's, it's fantastic that the ARU have got behind us and, and are going to implement an anti-homophobia policy, and we've put basically a challenge to all of the three other football, professional male football codes to do the same. And I had breakfast with David Gallup this morning, and he's definitely confirmed that the A-League are going to do it, and now we've just got to work on the other two leagues. So it's fantastic that we're actually bringing, I mean, not only rugby, I mean, rugby's way ahead of the others, but we're bringing the other leagues into the 21st century where they should have been a while ago. Well done and congratulations. Have a wonderful tournament. <laughs> we're going to finish before 2.30. We're going to finish before 2.30. Now, just to, um, to quickly give a very, very small tribute, and it will be small because I know he wants to do it. I, I, I looked at Nick when, when Andrew was up here and having a chat about it, and I could see Nick saying, wouldn't have been like that in my day, but, but the days are different. But this... The man that I just want to pay a very, very small tribute to, um, it's a very special day for him. Our, our patron, Richie Benno, was, is of course, is the patron, the long-term patron of the primary club. Um, wonderful man. We wish him all the best in recovery. But when Pete and I sat with a, a couple of the primary club members at the, the, the Machiavelli's restaurant, um, I think it was about 18 months ago, and we thought, well, who could be our patron? There was one, only one person that we wanted to ask. To me, he is the person along with his wife but the person the man but with his wife undoubtedly who's made the biggest contribution to this city um to this state and probably to the country and it's our patron sir nicholas shahady he celebrates his 87th birthday today and uh, i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna quickly throw to a um a little tribute video that we've put together Think 
think of all the men that played That took the knocks and made the grade The legends that the game has made I can't believe I'm here I'll wear the gold with the sleeve of green It makes me strong, it makes me keen And I'll go forward like a steel machine Till cracks in the foe appear Happy birthday, Nick. Um, you know, we've, we've got a table with your family, um, Michael, Alex, Susan, and, and, and their, their husbands and wives, and, and three of the grandchildren, and, and Marie, um, your, your friends from Germany. It's just fantastic to, to have you here. We're so honoured to have you as our patron, um, and I know you don't want us to make a fuss, but there's a small cake behind you. Uh, Fitz, you want to get on your feet? You're a good singer. I'm not a lousy singer. How about you lead us in song, Fitz? Birthday to you. Nicholas, I just happy birthday again, and what I mean, you've a patron of a million things. You've done a million things. I didn't want to go through that. If it, I know, if it personally, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have played. I wouldn't have played a rugby world cup because you're the one who introduced it. You're president of the Australian Rugby Union when I was there. Thank you on behalf of, of everyone who's involved in rugby. Thank you. This is a very special day for me because in 1947. On this day, 
I scored my only try on tour. <laughs> We were playing in Leicester and uh, we travelled back to London that night. We had food parcels from Australia and we sat in my room. There was Tubby Allen and uh, a few of those guys, uh, Arthur Buck and company, and we drank some warm beer and ate some soup out of a tin to celebrate my 21st birthday and it was really great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and, and just being here next to Andrew, mate, you didn't get that chance to pull on that Wallaby jersey, but mate, I, I was truly inspired by what you said today and, and, and your aspirations now to go to the Olympics and all that. Congratulations and thank you very much for being a part of our day. Um, Steph, I'll throw it back to you and, and thank you also, Steph, for, for being our MC today. You've done a fantastic job. My pleasure, Nick. Thank you. Now, I know Peter's taken the microphone away because he thinks you talk too much and he wants to get everyone out in the bar, but we have two raffles left to draw. Peter, if you could ask uh, either Sir Nicholas or perhaps uh, the Governor, Her Excellency, to draw the final number. And then you have the master list there and you can tell us who matches up to that number. This is the prize of the Magenta Shores Golf Stay. <laughs> And of course, while we're looking that one up, a thank you again to Italian wine importers and also to the Western and Adjoy Joshi at Nilgiri's. This one is the Magenta Shores Golf Stay. Peter, who is it? It is number 539, and you will tell me who's number 539 on that, while Her Excellency draws the second one. Uh, the, 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 the next raffle is in your envelope there, uh -huh. and it's for the financial members of the Cauliflower Club. Uh, this is the... Uh, There's only three people in here. The <laughs> You, Nick, and Jeff Erko, is that it? <laughs> okay, so the third, five, who's 539? Magenta Shores Golf Stay, the third the raffle five, three, prize. 539 is Bendel, Helen Bendel. Helen, are you here behind you, I think, somewhere? Okay, and the, and the final one is the financial members, Matt Ryland wins that one. Yep. Matt Ryman, is that correct? Matt, Ryland. Matt, if you're in the room, come and see me because you've won the uh, three nights for two people at uh, Kawakandera Villa Resort in Bali with a $1,300 travel voucher courtesy of Rob Wilkinson at Group Travel uh, Management. So congratulations to you and also to our third raffled winner. Ladies and gents, I've got a quick word for all of you. Thank you very much for coming. I want to thank you for being such an attentive group. I do many of these events and it's rare to have a room of this size that pays our speakers such respect. So thank you for that. Thank you for your contribution to people and sport with a disability. Thank you for having me. Don't forget the Stockade Ale. Thank you to Brew Pack. That'll be outside. And for a last word, Peter Fitzsimons. That's the last word. <laughs> Stephanie Brands. Please thank Stephanie Brands. Okay, just give me 30 seconds more. I see Michael Checker is here. Is that you, Michael Checker? Can you raise your right hand? And Waratah's coach, can we give him a round of applause? Uh, we're all behind you for next year. We hope the Waratahs, quite seriously, we will turn up in force for at least the first game. <laughs> we want to see wins, but anyway, good luck in the Renaissance. Just very quickly, um, Stockade Beer has donated beer. We're out there till about four o'clock. Sir Nicholas, Your Excellency, thank you so much for turning up. The Premier's just had the lead. It's been wonderful. I'll just say very quickly with Sir Nicholas, my favourite memory of your 48 tourists, we went to the funeral of Tubby Allen. We were all there, I think it was at the crematorium, and I think his coffin was borne by eight wallaby forwards. And this is a true story. They're all milling around, not sure what to do with the coffin. And the undertaker said, gentlemen, short line out. <laughs> That's how Tubby Allen went left, left this world on a short line out, born on the shoulders of the Wallaby forwards that he'd been with. It's not about the Wallabies, it's about people that play rugby, it's about inclusiveness. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is going to get bigger and better. I just want to say two more quick words. Andrew, can you just stand for a moment? And Kerry Henry, you two, you two are the driving force that make this work, okay? <laughs> Nick and I 
swan in and we swan out. But they, we're the hood ornaments on the thing that makes it work and you two are the engine that drive the whole thing. We've lost Andrew to the Bingham Cup. If anybody's got expertise in any particular field, you're most welcome to join us. But we want this, basically, the guts of it is this. We want this to get bigger and better. Everybody joined last year. We're struggling a little bit to get people to renew their memberships. Can you? Can you just do it without us hassling you? Can you put in the 50 bucks for a try? We would like to get this 2,000 strong so that every time we get a Wallaby prop, Wallaby front row that scores a try, we raise in nothing flat, 100 grand, and it goes to people with spinal injuries, concussion, you name it, whatever. But basically, rugby's given to us, let's give back to them. Thank you very much. Just very quickly, just one last thing. You, when you're all grogging on, just moment, when you're all grogging on, if you want to know if somebody's a forward or a back and they've got one of these tries, if it's like mine, we're a forward. If the bottom little one there is pink, they're expressing their inner girl, they are a back. <laughs> There's a bag in the middle. If you've got some donations, put it in there. It's going to a good cause. One more thanks to Stephanie Brantz. Thank you. See you next year. We'll have the Prime Minister next year. Thank you. That's why